you guys ever heard of the inverted pyramid? Maybe, no, yeah. Um, my journalism professor told me that this was a thing that was, I don't know if this is true, I probably shouldn't repeat it on TV, but um, he said that when they used to like send news stories over the wire, you know, 100 years ago, I don't know. Um, it was really important to get the most important information at the top because the, the message could always get cut off lower down and you didn't want to lose any good stuff. And that can kind of be hard because like when we write papers in school or you write a story or something like that, you always want your last line to be like awesome and you want to save a quote for the end. And sometimes it works. Like a human interest story really should have a nice wrap up at the end. But if you're writing a story about a protest, the last line of the story could be like, you know, please reopen the road at 3.30 or... <laughs> the last, I'm trying to think of a, another good example. Um, I wrote a story. I, see, this line might even get cut. That's how, like, I'm not sure how important it is. I wrote a story about um, something that happened at a party in Hatfield, and it was about a crime. And the very last line of the story is there was roughly 20 people at the party, and no one was drinking alcohol, according to reports. Like, doesn't seem that important, but if I don't say it, someone might be like, oh, a, you know, raging party in Hatfield or something like that. And that wasn't exactly what it was. So, um, it's not, it doesn't really work anywhere else in the story. It's not super important to the alleged crime and stuff like that. But, um, so I tack it on at the bottom and uh, maybe it gets cut for space and it doesn't hurt the story that bad. So the inverted pyramid is an upside down pyramid and you want the most important thing at the top of your story going down to the least important thing. Um, the, I guess, yeah, that's about that. Um, is that just to keep readers interested and read the rest of the story? It is. It's also just that, yeah, you, like you want, yeah, or, or if or if they do stop reading, at least they got the most important information, yeah. Um, and because the bottom might get cut. I mean, it doesn't, we pretty much, have, now that newspapers are made on computers, like, you know how much space you have, probably, I feel like you guys must have limits, limitless space, is yeah, it? Yeah. yeah. I mean, there's always the issue of, I'm working on a story right now that's like way, way long, and I want to tell all the details, but someone is not going to have time to read that and they're just going to stop reading it because it's too long and that's not good. So, um, yeah, having the most important information is up there is just a service to your readers and then also to make sure you don't lose them and that, you know, if something does need to get cut, that it doesn't get cut. Um, I wish I could tell you guys why these words are spelled this way, but I can't. <laughs> um, that word is lead. I don't know why it's not spelled just like the regular lead, but that's how we spell it. Um, and the lead is your first sentence or first paragraph sometimes. I usually like to keep them really short. Um, and it is supposed to draw people in. So it's, it can totally depend what kind of lead you write, depending on what kind of story you're writing. If you're writing a story about, um, I don't know, like a people getting evicted from a homeless camp, you, your first line of your story could be 30 people were evicted from a homeless camp on Hockenham Road today or something like that. Or your lead could be, you know, this guy cried as he said that, you know, his, that tent had all his belongings and like now he's tossed out on the street. And then your next line could be, he was one of 30 people who were evicted from Tent Village in New York City or whatever. Um, and that is a much more interesting lead and more personal and might draw people in more. And you're getting to the real meat of what the article is about in the next sentence. I mean, if some, some people write, can write some really long leads, and I've written some long leads that are like several paragraphs before you tell people why you're telling them this anecdote from a person or why you're, why you're describing this scene or something like that. Um, like if I wrote an article about someone who died in a car accident, I might say friends and family were called so-and-so to be like this, and, and th you know, they were going to school here or something like that. And then like in the next paragraph, I might say you know, so-and-so died in an accident Friday or whatever. Um, sometimes, so, so getting the most interesting lead is really great. Sometimes you have a quote that's like so good or a story someone tells that's really great, and maybe it really sums up what you're trying to say, or maybe it's just really interesting, or it's funny. I love funny ones. Um, if that's a great one where like news of the weird is like a great, you know, if you, uh, yeah, two-headed frog, that's all I know. Um, get that in the lead. Um, but sometimes things are not, like a lot of times in court, now that I'm doing court, the lead is more set in stone. It's so-and-so is going to prison for three years for this drug crime. Um, 
today I got to write one about a guy who pleaded guilty to stealing clothes that had been donated for homeless people from a church on Christmas Eve. So it's like, it's like oh, I had to stuff all that stuff in that lead. Um, and I could have just said, you know, pleaded guilty to larceny a year later or something like that. Um, but sometimes it is really good to just kind of put the facts in there. If it's a complicated issue, I wrote a story, the story I wrote about the service dogs and stuff like that. My lead was not the most gripping lead, but it was like, I really just had to be basic about it and I had to say, uh, a recent showdown over a service dog in East Hampton has brought to light the confusing issues surrounding service dogs and emotional support animals and their regulations. Sounds kind of, it's kind of like maybe scared some people off because it sounded too technical, but um, yeah, so you kind of have to use your discretion like that. If I had started that story with the story about what happened in East Hampton, it would have taken me eight inches to even get to the main point of the article, and people would be like, why am I reading this? Um, the nut graph is kind of like the context that I told you guys about before. Nut graph, uh, it's called that because it's like in a nutshell. So this is where you're kind of telling people, you don't have to exactly spell out what your article is about, but it's where you put in the background and the context. So your protest about Michael Brown, you're saying, this protest was one of thousands across the country this week. Here's why people are so angry and stuff like that. Um, if you didn't have that, it would be a huge missing piece of that story. Sometimes I have always had trouble with nut graphs, like especially in stories that are not as clear as those ones, where it's maybe more of a human interest story. You know, the nut graph isn't going to present itself so much because what is the context for like a story about a person? Other than it's kind of you're kind of you might kind of sum up why you're telling that story like you know uh, I don't know you know Barbara started doing the cat project at this year and this is what it's turned into now she has a house full of 30 cats that she adopts out and stuff like that so um, I like to get the quotes from people really high up in the story sometimes you can't do that sometimes you need to introduce like so much more information before the quotes will make sense and that's something sometimes I don't realize it until I'm writing the story and I say oh I wish I had just asked them like a, a really basic question like, can you tell me what happened this weekend? <laughs> As opposed to being like, okay, I heard about what happened this weekend, can you answer this one specific question? Because then you don't have a big quote from them that is kind of general and has the, all their you know feelings about the thing in it. Um, yeah, I really like having a lot of quotes and stories. Sometimes it's hard, sometimes I, issues are too complicated to get you know, in the amount of space you have to get all the quotes in there. But um, I like to have people high up in the story uh, kind of putting their voice in it because I like it when their voice is in it as opposed to mine. Um, in using the quotes, there are direct and indirect quotes. Like you can paraphrase people. And in fact, if you are not positive the quote is right, you should absolutely paraphrase them all the time. Um, be careful when you're paraphrasing them. Don't, don't like, sometimes you can set it up and uh, you're not paraphrasing the, you're not paraphrasing them accurately by the way you set it up. And sometimes you won't see it until your editor says it and you'll be like, oh yeah, that's right. Like it makes it sound like she means this and that's not what she meant at all. Um, so be careful when you paraphrase. Um, but it's much better than fudging the quote and like thinking, oh, like I think this is like for me, it's like if I can't read my notes, I can't use that quote. <laughs> and especially, you know, if there's if there's a meeting video or something you can watch, then you're great. You can like check it out, yeah. check Jen's video, <laughs> um, and uh, you know double check your quotes is always great. But um, if you're not confident about it, don't use it. Um, if one of the things that I think that I learned how to do in high school English class, and then I had to like unlearn, is like really setting up your quotes by like kind of preparing. Like I, I would write, and I'd be like, so and so said she really liked, um, you know, going to the journalism workshop at NCTV, and then the next quote will be like, yeah, I really enjoyed going to it. It was really great and informative, or something like that. And it's like I just totally just said what she's gonna said, and then I had her say it, and I don't need to do that. You can just be like, one of the people at the at the citizen workshop was this person who said they you know are an aspiring journalist and then have them say whatever they say and you don't even sometimes, <laughs> yeah and sometimes you can set it up even less than that like you know sometimes you don't need to set it up and you can just have the quote and then afterwards say said said so and so at the event um you know they're from Northampton or something like that um I don't love using quotes you know when people um like start writing a sentence and then they have like half a sentence quoted. I wish I had put an example of this on there. Um, 
but you could say, you know, if I said, Jen said the forum was really exciting and then started quoting her and said, but, you know, it went on for too long. <laughs> um, I, I just feel like the flow of those sometimes is messed up. I'm not saying I don't ever use them, but it's, I think it's harder for people to read. And then they maybe have to like look back and, and try to kind of read that as a whole sentence. Yeah. Or if uh, someone, you know, you're talking about someone in the third person and then in the quote they're, they say I. If it's just like just it just doesn't really make sense. Yeah, um, it's not to say you can't do it. I think I may have even did it in my story today, but uh, I try to avoid it if I can. Yeah, um, yeah. If the quotes sound, if you like read the sentence that you put the quote in and it sounds weird to you, maybe reread it so it's easier to read. Um, so you at this point you've like written most of your story. All the important information is up at the top. Maybe lower down you're answering questions that are a little specific that you think people might have, like um, like how I talked about that the line about how many people were at the party and that no one was drinking alcohol. Like, it is not important enough to go higher up in the story, but if people are wondering, here it is. Um, and at that point, you might find that you have holes in your story that you need to explain more. Um, like, I was, when I was writing that story, before I had saw the part in the court records that said that there was no alcohol at this party, I said, "Whoa, this is a high school party where like there were, there were chaperones at it, like that they could charge them for that. Like I know that that's like a thing that you know they are charging parents for having parties now. And so I like started writing an email to the DA asking if there were like maybe going to be charges about this. And then I like kept reading and I was like, "Oh yeah, that's right. There's no alcohol at this party, so like I don't need to. I need, don't need to answer." But if there was, that would have been a hole in the story. It would have been like someone would have commented on that story and been like, "Why aren't these parents being held accountable for this right. drunken party or something like that?" Um, and now, hopefully, that will not happen. Um, yeah. So there might be holes in your story, and you might have to call people back. Um, you have to be okay with it because sometimes it like is hard, and you feel like you're. Sometimes you gotta call them like three times, <laughs> and you're like, "I'm so sorry to bother you again. Just have this one last question." You know, sometimes you can like, I like put it on my editor, and I'll be like, "You know, I, you know, my editor really wants me to ask this one question or something like that," um, because uh, sometimes there are just glaring holes that you really need to fix up um, in your story, and you won't realize it until you write it. Sometimes. Um, this is great for a website, like adding something where people can find more information. Like if you're advancing an event, like we advance a lot of things that we're not going to cover as a great way to cover them, like a concert or something like that. And you're like, you never want to like say, here's a concert, tickets are five bucks, and then not tell people where to buy them. So then you can add, you know, for more information, go to the Smith College website at this address or something like that, or call this person at this address and stuff like that. Um, and when you're on a website, that's like super easy because you can just hyperlink everything. Um, I don't have much advice for editing it other than like read it really carefully, spell check, um, check people's names. One of the things that is like the most embarrassing thing I've ever done was, it's totally the most embarrassing thing I ever did, is write a story and feel so confident about what I was writing about because it was my beat and I knew who I was talking about and I knew about the issue and stuff like that. And my and I used the, I used the wrong name for the person because I was thinking of like I just used the name of a um, select woman in a different town because it was the same first name and I totally used the wrong last name. And that's like awful because <laughs> it's very confusing to people because I just made up this person basically. Um, and all the you know, everything great that was said in that story doesn't make as much sense at all when you don't know who said it or, you know, what their last name is and stuff like that. Um, so that's a good reason to, like, come back to your story, to, like, leave it for a minute and come back to it and try to read it with fresh eyes because I knew I was just looking for spelling mistakes and, like, flow issues and missing words and stuff like that. And instead I had this huge error right in the, you know, first sentence of the story that I just glanced over because I recognized the name. I knew it was the name was spelled right. It just wasn't the right name. Yeah. Um, I can't believe I just admitted that. Um, it was a long time ago. Uh, <laughs> it, um, yeah, so, so that's a good way to edit your stories. Um, if you have missing words and you're reading quickly, you won't notice. Like if, like I see it happen too much that there are 
words missing or extra words in like the first line of a story. And that breaks my heart because it's like, that's the most important line of the story. No one's going to keep reading if there's a big problem in the first sentence. And what happens is, I don't know if you guys have ever seen this, but like someone will show you a sentence and you know what that sentence is supposed to mean. You know what you meant it to mean. It's a common phrase or something like that. And so you don't, wor you don't notice that there's a word missing right in the beginning. So um, yeah, it's good to like leave the story for a minute and then come back to it and try to read it again with fresh eyes. You can read it aloud. A lot of people do that, um, and that's a good way to find that. Um, having edit other people edit your work is great, and I think that all your pieces will get edited by someone. Yeah, usually I look yeah. them over; they'll mm -hmm. come through me. And I'll yeah, kind of um, and it's good to uh, you know work with your editors about like you know sometimes I put things in stories and I put like a little note by them that I'm like let's talk about this because I feel like my editor is gonna say. No, nah, we can't really say that or something like that, but I want to have that conversation. So, um, yeah, so there are things that might get cut from your story and you have to be cool with it. But, yeah, mostly making sure that the writing is good is very important and that um, everything is accurate. And if you're writing about something like I am in court where I'm talking about allegations all the time, everything is alleged, making sure that at no point in the story do I call someone. I mean, we don't even like to call people, you know, the, the rape victim or something like that because just saying alleged victim doesn't sound the same, so we might say, you know, the woman or something like that. Try to avoid that, you know, trying to say, you want to say something's alleged, but it certainly doesn't flow nicely when you say alleged victim all the time because it yeah. doesn't sound good either way.